Hello, I am Crystal Johnson, Deputy Center Director of Goddard Space Flight Center, NASA Goddard Space Flight Center, responsible for research and technology development at NASA. I am very thrilled and honored to be the moderator of the Future in Space panel. Very excited about the panel members and some of the information that you're going to hear today. We've got some amazing panel members, and I'm not going to spend any time reading their resumes to you. I know that you can click on the link associated with this, this conference and find out more information about them, but I'm going to save every minute for you to be able to listen to some of the amazing conversation that's going to take place here today. First of all, we have Dr. Jim Green, James Green. He's the chief scientist at NASA. We have Dr. Farouk El Baz, who's the director of the Center of Remote Sensing at Boston University. He hasn't joined us just yet, but we're expecting him to join. And Dr. Douglas Terrier, the chief technologist at NASA. Say hi, Doug. <laughs> uh, Dr. Fabienne Cascoli, the president of the Observatoire de Paris. Um, and, uh, and Mr. Omran Sharaf, he's the project manager of the Emirate Mars mission. Um, the Hope Probe and Mohammed bin Rashid Space Center, a United Arab Emirates Space Agency. So welcome to all of you. I'm very, very excited about the conversation that we're gonna have because so many people, everything that we're gonna be talking about here today is focused and centered on Mars. One of the great things about today is we get to probe some of the fundamental questions that so many people are asking. Like, why go to Mars? And why go to Mars now of all times? And, and, and what's the relationship between Mars and Earth? Can we, can we understand the relationship between them? And how will we get to Mars? Uh, there are so many different challenges um, in the way of, of having humans to go to Mars. What's it gonna take for us to be able to get there? And then talking about planetary observations and how do planetary observations relate to Mars? And then we get to hear some special details about the UAE's Mars efforts. And we're all excited to hear about that. And so let's go ahead and dive in. First, let's hear some opening introductory comments from Dr. Jim Green. Hi, Jim. Hi, Crystal. Thanks very much. Um, uh, I think um, you have asked me uh, some provocative questions such as <laughs> why are we going to Mars? And indeed, there are many reasons for that. I'm going to pick out a few that I really like. You know, there's a set of strategic uh, reasons. These would be uh, improving our quality of life here on Earth. We have found demonstratively how important the space program is in terms of developing technologies that enable our life to be better for that. And indeed, going to Mars is going to continue that, that ongoing development of key technologies that will enable so many things happening on another planet, but also the benefits that we receive from those. Of course, going to Mars means we want to do it in an international framework. You know, this is one of the great quests that the humanity of this planet should really be embracing and working hard in peaceful ways to indeed explore our solar system. The solar system is humanities. Let's explore it together. Now, there are many practical reasons too. You know, Mars is really unique in the solar system. In fact, uh, as a beautiful planet, it is much like Earth, far more so than Venus. It has an atmosphere. Uh, of course, the geology is very diverse like Earth. It has climate on it. It has a surface we can learn to live and work on. And so it, it is an important planet from that perspective. It also has a whole series of important resources that will enable us to live and work on the planet Mars, such as water. Now, even though Mars has lost an enormous amount of water, it was a blue planet early on. When Earth was a blue planet, so was Mars. But over time, it lost its magnetic field, and we believe the solar wind and the ablation that occurs with the solar wind stripping away oxygen and therefore uh, not being able to combine and create water has then reduced the amount of water that it has had. 
And we believe it's down to maybe 13% of what it used to have. But it's still there. It's, it's trapped in ISIS. It's trapped underground, perhaps in aquifers also. So it has a wonderful resource. Now, we've been on the surface of Mars with rovers, spirit and opportunity, but curiosity in particular. And this has really enabled us to examine the soils. Now, it turns out the soils have uh, essential plant nutrients, not only the micronutrients like iron and magnesium, zinc and copper, but also the macronutrients, oxygen, carbon, hydrogen, nitrogen, so important for fertilizer. So, so yes, Mark Watney could grow potatoes on Mars, all right? There's also a whole series of important science questions of why we want to go to Mars. Uh, for instance, what's happened on Mars can happen here on Earth. You know, as the Earth goes through its normal magnetic field cycle, we know it reverses. We've modeled the reversals, and we see the field uh, goes to very low values, and therefore, uh, when that occurs, the processes that are happening on Mars right now without a magnetic field will be the same processes that will happen here at Earth when our field flips. So by studying uh, these terrestrial planets, Mars in particular, we really get a sense of what happens uh, here on Earth in the evolution of our planet. But you know, scientifically, to me, probably the best and top reason is that it could answer some important questions about the origin of life. Okay? Mm. Now, that's pretty astounding when you think about it. How could that possibly be? Well, if life started on Mars at the same time it started on Earth, and by the way, both planets were blue planets with huge oceans at the same time. What's happened here on Earth with plate tectonics and weathering and, and the, all the geological changes that are occurring is that early rock record when life started on Earth has probably been completely eroded away, but not on Mars. And so by going to Mars, we're going to look at that ancient surface. We'll see the geological history of Mars and how and why the climate changed so much on Mars. So by going to Mars, we can answer some really spectacular questions. So as a scientist, I really want to go to Mars and study it. Humans on Mars will enable that study in enormous ways that we can't do with robotic missions. As explorers, you know, it's sort of in our genes to explore. But also as humans, I think we really must do this. We really need to move out in the solar system. And Mars is that destination for the future. Thank That's you. awesome. Awesome, awesome. Thank you so much. So it takes different vantage points for us to actually understand all of the mechanisms that that make Mars what it is. It takes going and exploring in person and it takes some looking at doing some observations from the ground. And Fabian, you have done a, a wide variety of observations of multiple planets. Share with us your thoughts on this this topic. Thank you, Krista. Um, thank you, Jim, for this beautiful introduction to why should we go to Mars? And I've been thinking to, at the, this question, why should we take humans on Mars? Yes. And I think that the answer is we should go there because it's possible. Hmm. There is no physical law that forbids uh, this. Contrary to interstellar travel, at speeds larger than light with the light velocity. Well, this is not possible, I think. Um, I come from physics. But going to Mars, and even more coming back from Mars, I think it's technically difficult. It's probably very expensive, but it's possible. And if it's possible, we are going to do it. I'm going I'm convinced that there will be humans exploring Mars in the near future. I'm not very convinced that we are going to colonize Mars, but <laughs> exploring, explore, explore Mars, yes. Science is not the main driver for exploring Mars. 
But science can benefit a lot from human exploration of the red planet. As Jim explained, there are many reasons, we many questions that we ask about the origin of, of life on Earth that can find answers on Mars. We know that Mars was habitable billions of years ago, and in Observatoire de Paris, my institute, astronomers, planetologists they are very much interested in understanding what happened to Mars that makes it inhabitable now. And um, also, if there is signs that we can see of past life on Mars. These scientists, they have even built instruments or part of instruments for some of the space missions that are uh, heading to Mars now, and in particular, um, the SuperCam instrument on Mars 2020 on the Perseverance rover. It will, this instrument, We'll examine rocks and soils with a camera, a laser, and spectrometers to seek organic compounds that could be related to past life on Mars. This is a really a very powerful instrument. You can uh, examine um, the chemical composition on a rock that will be seven meters away from the rover. This, is, uh, this was a tremendous adventure to build this instrument. It's a very engaging, challenging for, for researchers, for engineers, for industry. Imagine that there will be a laser on this rover that has been built by a French company, Thales Laser. And this laser is a very small one, miniaturized, and you know, it's a very small amount of power. It's really incredible. Uh, here at uh, Paris Observatory, we have also developed an instrument, we are developing an instrument, an infrared spectrometer for the Japanese mission that is going to um, go to one of the Mars um, satellites, uh, to Phobos, one of the Mars moons, and bring back some samples. Uh, this mission, Mars Moves Moon Explorer, should be launched in 2024. And of course, we are using interpreting data for all these missions. And um, the, the NASA, NASA rover, rovers and orbiters, uh, the ESA trace gas orbiter, and we are uh, looking uh, with great interest data from uh, the Emirates uh, Mars mission. So we are very busy with these robotic missions. But as I said, uh, human missions can provide great opportunities for science for reasons that are very pragmatic. You know, these robotic missions they are very limited in resources, in power, in mass, in volume. But, well, if you bring humans to Mars, you need space, you need um, power. Uh, you, need, you know, humans are fragile, but much more fragile than robots. And so we, we should be allowed to have uh, bigger instruments and less fragile instruments if we go to with humans. This is really very pragmatic reasons. Um, since, in principle, we want to bring back humans, you know, when they go to Mars, we, we, we would like to bring back them to, to Earth. We should also be able to bring back samples with these humans, with these astronauts. And above all, I think, uh, well, I think that uh, humans are still smarter than robots. Who knows, maybe with artificial intelligence, they will become, you know, we will have uh, um, um, robots that will be able to find fossils or to react quickly to things that they have not been trained for that. But for the time being, uh, well, humans are much smarter. There is a drawback. Um, the landing sites of human missions, I believe they will be chosen because, um, well, you know, they are not dangerous. Um, flat uh, planes without any rocks. So not very exciting for geologists. Maybe even the geologist nightmare, a nightmare. So, well, there is a compromise to find. So my conclusion to this introductory remarks will be a strong recommendation to the space agencies. When you send human to Mars, take some scientists with you. <laughs> But not only, it's only because they know uh, how to can imagine how to grow potatoes on Mars, but so it's also because Mars is really key to some important questions 
about the origin of life on Earth has been explained beautifully. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you so much, Fabian. And now we've been joined by Farouk Elbaz. And so, Farouk, could you offer your, your intro, your comments to the panel? To the well, thank you very much. Thank you very much. And uh, I, I, I certainly support the idea that if you go to Mars, you have to take a geologist because we <laughs> certainly can learn a great deal about uh, the geology of the Earth and of Mars when we see and I, in my talk, I will make a very uh, kind of clear point about the uh, relationship or the similarities between the surface features of Mars and the surface features of the Earth's deserts. So that's just an introduction. I will talk about that later. All right, thank you so much. Okay, so now we know that it's going to be um, an amazing thing for us to go. And we also know that there are gonna be challenges. So let's hear from Doug Terrier about what some of those challenges just might be and how we're planning to address those challenges. Doug? Hey, hello everyone, I'm Douglas Terrier, NASA's Chief Technologist. And it is really an honor to be a part of this very, uh, very impressive panel and very impressive discussion that we're having today. So yeah, we heard from Fabian and, and Jim about the why we're going to Mars. I'd like to switch a little bit now and talk about how we're gonna do that from the technology standpoint, some of the challenges of very, very briefly of how we're doing that. And um, first of all, let me make the point that I always make it very clear, when we go into space, any space mission, we're really trying to do some of the most difficult, most challenging things human beings have ever attempted. And as a result of that, we're required to push the boundaries of science and boundaries of technology. And in addition to what we learn in space, it's always important to remember that we, we find that we, we inevitably make breakthroughs that we don't even anticipate that return tremendous value back to life here on Earth. We've seen that in the last several decades of exploration, everything from miniaturized computer to water purification, air purification that we've had to challenge those challenges in space. We've been able to find applications on Earth that have helped us with sustainable living here on Earth. Uh, sustainable forms of energy and everything else. We expect exactly the same as we meet the challenges to go to Mars. So let, what, what, so what about Mars? Let's, let's talk about what's hard about Mars. The most obvious thing is Mars is really far. So we have today, we have um, human beings have been living and working in space, an international space station, international team for over two decades. Um, the international space station is approximately three or 400 kilometers altitude is about the distance a few hours away. When we talk about going to the moon, we're looking at an order of now three orders of magnitude further away, 300,000, 400,000 kilometers away. At Mars at its furthest, on the other side of the sun, is another three orders of magnitude away, um, 300 million miles or so, 300 million kilometers or so away. So it's very important to recognize that the, the most important from a technological standpoint the most important thing to recognize is we're talking about very, very long distances, which mean long duration space flight, long periods in space for the human system and the machine system. That implies a couple things. First thing it implies is that we have a significant light time travel between Earth and the, any potential station on Mars, any potential vehicles at Mars. We're already doing that with a host of rovers and orbiters, as we mentioned, but the light time can be up to 40 minutes which implies that we have to have a great degree of autonomy, a different way of operating than we do, for example, at the space station, or even on the moon, we're only seconds, you know, a couple seconds away, we can have a lot of intervention. We need, a, we need to have a lot of autonomy built into our vehicles. Uh, fortunately, we are, the, the, we are, we're taking a very stepwise and logical way to develop these capabilities as we move forward. The second thing that's, that, that this distance implies is a great deal of consumables required for both humans and humans to survive what could be up to a nine month trip to Mars, potentially up to a year long stay on the surface and nine months in return. So up to two, you know, two year long journey, we're talking literally metric tons of water and food and consumables that we require to sustain a crew for that long period, not to mention spare parts and consumables for the vehicle itself. And then, of course, we have to overcome the environment of space itself. Uh, radiation environment, once we're outside the Van Allen belts, is quite severe. Both the vehicles and the humans have to survive in that environment. So what that means is, in all likelihood, as we look forward to exploring 
destinations like Mars that are far away. We're going to have to do a lot more in terms of using uh, a lot of the uh, what available resources are on the surface, on there in situ. So that's a technology that is key to exploration of any far destinations, really learning how to live and work using the materials, the consumables, resources that we find on the surface. As was mentioned before, we've been very fortunate, and as I said, that the way we're doing this in a stepwise fashion, we have observatories that are giving us the prospecting, understanding the resources that are there. We know both the moon and Mars have, have water in various forms available, which can be used to make fuel, can be used to make oxygen, consumables for the, the crew. Um, so we need to learn how to do that. We're going about this in a stepwise fashion. And one thing that's gonna be a key characteristic of any future exploration is it's gonna be an international collaborative effort. We've learned over the last 20 years how to do that very well with an international partnership on the, on the International Space Station, highly successful. We have, the International Space Station, in fact, is the first leg of this stepwise learning process. What we're doing there is learning how to live in space for long periods up to well, over a year in some cases, how to have the human system survive, how to grow, even to grow food and to recycle air, recycle water. We're learning how to do that in space, um, uh, long-term living and working. Our next step in our effort is to go back to the moon with our Artemis Moon to Mars program. In 2024, we plan to land the first woman on the surface of the moon. And this time we go to stay for a long, sustainable stay, meaning our efforts will be targeted first with robotic uh, missions that are already some in place, uh, mapping the consumables on the surface. We know there's a great deal of water in the, in the polar regions. We have now uh, a series of robotic explorers that will go starting next year to go and test out some of this in-situ resource utilization efforts. And eventually we'll send humans and the Artemis 3 in 2024 down to the surface of the moon and we expect to start the process of learning how to extract those resources, use them to build consumables and fuel, and to live and work for long periods. That gives us a second piece of the puzzle. As I mentioned, International Space Station, we're learning how to live and work for long periods in space. Next thing is we need to learn how to live and work on the surface of another planet. Not for hours like in Apollo, but for days or months even. We'll do that with the Artemis program in the next decade. And then finally, we'll use the moon and its resources as we learn to extract those resources, potentially as a, a, um, a port, if you will, a refueling station a, on the way to Mars. We will depart from Mars, from what we call the international, or the, the uh, gateway, an orbiting platform around the moon, use that as a departure point to then send crews on to Mars. So it's really a, a very exciting set of challenges ahead of us ones that we intend to meet with our international community. Um, I think we have a, a very well laid out stepwise plan to really meet each of these challenges and understand the technologies, develop the, the mitigation strategies, and finally be able to live and work in, on Mars for a long period of time in the coming decades. All right. Well, thank you very much, Doug. And it's exciting to hear about Artemis. Love to hear about it all of the time. But also love to hear about the Emirates Mars mission. So, Omran, could you share with us your, your thoughts about this and, and what you're doing with this mission? Thank you, Crystal, and thank you, everyone. Uh, it's a great honor and pleasure to be with you all. Um, so when it comes to the Emirates Mars mission, the approach that we took with this mission, or the UAE took, uh, is slightly different than other nations. Uh, usually you have the science uh, driving the mission. Usually there are things that are related to um, scientific objectives that, that, that guides it or technical objectives uh, when it comes to that. Um, uh, and then just use the, the, the ripple effect of that project or the, the, the byproducts of those projects to, to, to benefit humanity as Jim highlighted earlier today and even Douglas. Um, however, with the UAE, basically what the government wanted to see is that they wanted to see a disruptive change. They wanted to see a, a shift in the mindset of Emirati youth and the Arab youth. Uh, they wanted to see an advanced science and technology sector being created in the UAE. And they wanted this project to be the catalyst for that major shift. Awesome. Uh, they awesome. wanted to disrupt the education sector. They wanted to disrupt the industrial sector. They wanted to, to disrupt the economical model that we have in the UAE and turn it into a more creative, innovative, 
uh, and the competitive knowledge-based economy. So we talk about the post-oil economy. So it's actually about the future of the UAE. It's about the future of the region. It's about the future of our economy. Um, so this mission was announced in summer 2014. And that was uh, six years ago. Uh, so we had literally six years to deliver the mission. Uh, the first requirement that was given to us by the government was uh, to reach Mars before the 2nd of December 2021, which is the 50th anniversary of the establishment of the UAE. Why? Uh, basically, the UAE government wanted to send a very strong message to the Arab youth, uh, to the youth in the region, is that if a young nation like the UAE is able to reach Mars in less than 50 years, then you can do much more. Given your history, uh, given how this region used to be a generator of knowledge, uh, more than 800 years ago, we had people from different backgrounds, different faith, living together, building the region, generating new knowledge, giving back to humanity. The moment we stopped thinking and generating knowledge and contributing to humanity, we started moving backwards as a region. Mm -hmm. And the past couple of years, it's not been good. It's, we are living in a, in a, in a, in a tough neighborhood. Uh, and the thing is also, basically, you talk about a region that has more than 100 million youth in it. A lot of potential, a lot of skills. Unfortunately, the past... 10 years, a lot, of been, a lot of them have been leaving the region and, 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 and which is not helping us to build it. Mm -hmm. And the ones who stayed, some of them were joining the wrong groups and innovating and being creative in the wrong ways. Uh, the UAE as a country, we have more than 200 nationalities living in it. People from different backgrounds contributed, contributed in building our nation. So, so it's, it's a model that, 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 that promotes coexistence, acceptance of difference, and, and, and serving the bigger good humanity and building the, the country and nation together. So that's the message that the U.S. wants to send to the Arab youth. To the Emirati youth, it's about basically building an advanced science technology sector. Why? Because the UAE needs to have local capability when it comes to addressing our economical challenges and also our other national challenges when it comes to water uh, resources, when it comes to food resources. We live in a tough neighborhood. The geography here is, is, is it's a desert. So if you're able to put a human uh, in space or on Mars one day and make them survive in such harsh environment, that technology will definitely benefit you. So that, it's about the set of skills that we, we want to gain through this mission. So the Amherst Mars mission was a mean or a catalyst for a much bigger objective. Uh, the other requirement that the prime minister gave us actually when he met us uh, in 2013, uh, actually, at the end of 2013, uh, he said, Build it, don't buy it. Work with others, learn from others, do not start from scratch. And this is why we were able to deliver the mission in such a short period of time with significant Emirati contribution. So we had a team of Emiratis working in the UAE and the team of Emiratis working with our main partners at the University of Colorado uh, uh, at last, LASP, uh, and a team that was basically moving back and forth between us, between UAE and, and the US. Uh, and so basically science diplomacy was, played a big role in, in, in international collaboration, played a big role in building this capacity. The impact of this mission, we saw actually students shifting majors from international relationship, finance and economy, and going into uh, math, chemistry and physics. Uh, the, the companies invested a lot in actually building technical capability when it comes to engineering. However, the scientific uh, side was a little bit weak. We, a lot, like the, the scientists didn't have much of a career path. The engineers had a career path. But if you want to build an, an advanced science and technology sector, you meet the ones who come up with new discoveries uh, that the engineers will take and convert it to products. So basically, universities that did not have any science programs started science program because of the Emirates Mars mission. The UAE did not have a space agency at that point. So uh, in the Mohammed Barash Space Center, actually, it's a Dubai government, so it's a local entity. But the same team was tasked to actually put uh, a vision for the for the UAE Space Agency. So as one of the byproducts of this mission was also the establishment of the UAE Space Agency. Um, and then one other requirement that was given to us by the Prime Minister was the science has to be novel. It shouldn't be something that's been done before. We need to give back to humanity. So the Amherst Mars mission will be providing for the first time to the scientific community around the world uh, with no restrictions. It will be open and available to everyone. Uh, a holistic view of the Martian atmosphere at different times of the day, uh, at different uh, seasons. Uh, it's going to study the relationship between the lower layer and the upper layer of the Martian atmosphere and the escape rate of hydrogen and oxygen. So it will complement the previous missions. Uh, and also it will basically um, hopefully come up with new questions for future missions. 
So this is the story of the Emirates Mars mission, and this is why the UAE is actually established a space program. You know, it's, it's not about competing, it's about collaboration. It's about coming up with a new model, about delivering a mission uh, in a less time frame, six years. Similar missions usually take between 10 to 12 years. And it's our first mission that, that we sent, uh, so the UAE's first, the region's first outer space exploration mission, uh, let alone a Mars mission. Uh, so there's a lot to learn, and, and Mars is difficult. Mars is hard. Uh, so, so this is the model that the UAE wants to come. It's like, don't start from scratch. Start with others, collaborate, uh, work with others, and you don't have to do everything on your own. Uh, for example, we, the command and control room that we have is actually in, in Dubai. That's the main one that we control the spacecraft from. However, we're utilizing the ESN network. So instead of us building our own deep space network, we're just using the deep space networks available around the world. Uh, when it came to the launcher, we used uh, MHI as, as a launcher, la launcher for, for our mission. Uh, the team focused on building the spacecraft and the instruments on the spacecraft with our partners uh, in the US. Uh, and our main partners were basically academic partners, those transfer partners. As I mentioned earlier, the University of Colorado at Boulder, Arizona State University, and the University of California in Berkeley. Uh, so this is a brief about uh, UA's mission to Mars. Awesome, awesome, awesome. I absolutely love the principles, the foundation that you all have established in order to be able to get your space agency off the ground and the impact that it's gonna have on the youth. I think that is so critically important for the future of all of our nations to make sure that our youth are inspired, our youth are engaged, and they are really looking forward to the future. One question that I have for you, there are so many space programs around the world, many of them in their infancy, and, and the Middle East, there are several in the Middle East that are, that are still relatively um, young. So what would you say to, to those people who say that a crewed mission to Mars is overly ambitious for a young space program? What would you say to them? Uh, well, if, if one thing this mission proves is that, uh, I mean, sometimes impossible is possible. Um, I mean, <laughs> six years, <laughs> a lot of people at the beginning of the mission told us you won't be able to launch it even in, in time. However, we had to really innovate. We had to come up with a new approach to doing things by simplifying things and, and learning from others. So, so it, it's, it's, we're not underestimating that. It's difficult, yes. And as we mentioned even earlier in the panel, that it's not easy to put a human on Mars. It'll take time, it'll take, it'll take resources. However, it will happen one day. We have the knowledge. It's about taking that knowledge and converting it into something that works. Uh, right. and, and I mean, again, so many benefits by just developing that technology, you will address a lot of the big challenges that we have on Earth, especially when it comes to water resources and food, food resources. Absolutely. So we have one question from someone in the audience, and I'd like to say for all of you out there, this panel is very interested in taking your questions. They'd love to hear from you. So any questions that you have, please go ahead and send them and I will ask the questions for you. The first question that we have is, can we really get back from Mars if we go all the way out and come back? Doug, you were talking about that uh, in yours. You talked about the amount of time that it would take to go out and come back. Can you really get back? <laughs> Well, yeah, absolutely. At any mission, we certainly any human mission will for, be predicated on our very high prop, very high confidence that we can get back. But I think it's a it's a valid question because the you know we talked about the distance, the the fuel required to get there is significant, incredible, many many hundred you know metric tons of fuel. We will of course be staging the way that the way we're going to go about this in the current planning is to stage a lot of the. The, uh, the departure stages and the, and the two moves that we need. Maybe in the vicinity around the moon, I mentioned the gateway, which we're building out an infrastructure around the moon. That'll give us a very low gravity region from which we can depart from with, um, with a, you know, a very heavy load of fuel and so on. But in the long run, the, the real question is, can you in fact take to Mars all the consumables, not just, not just the fuel, but the oxygen and the food and the resources that you need to come back? Initially, what we'll probably need to do is to pre-position a lot of the, 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 all the consumables that we need for the return trip to be pre-positioned on the surface, which is why I mentioned before that um, autonomous operation and long duration, um, you know, autonomous uh, systems being able to maybe be in situ mm -hmm. for up to two years. They could be there simply as pre-positioned supply or in, 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 our, in, the, in the long run, could there be plants that are there manufacturing the fuel and the consumables necessary for the return trip? 
and have that available. And then you'd want to make sure that those are fully available and, um, and you know you've got a green light before you depart, that you have all the materials on the surface ready for your return. But I think it's a, it's a really great qu question. Um, it is a, a, if you just look at the entire um, um, fuel and consumables required for a complete round trip, it is very much at the, very, at the edge of our ability to do that. We think we could do that, uh, but it would be extremely heavy and costly, uh, you know, a large vehicle. The much more elegant solution is to be able to, as I said, use the resources that are there to refuel, replenish the spacecraft for the return journey. And I suspect that's the architecture we will employ in the long run. All right. Thank you, Doug. So, Farouk, question for you. Oh, sure. Go ahead, Jim. I, I just wanted to build uh, on that very quickly, and that is, um, uh, as Doug is talking about, humans going and returning. But in reality, we, we take these in small steps. Uh, so currently, we have a mission on the way to Mars. It's called Perseverance, and it's designed to core rock. So here's an example of one of the cores from the engineering unit it will then be placed in uh, tubes, and these metal tubes will be placed on the surface. And now what we're doing is designing a set of missions that will return those tubes, all right? We'll have a rover land on the surface, collect them, put them in a Mars Ascent vehicle. Right now we're, we're developing that Mars Ascent vehicle. And um, uh, we'll return a set of, you know, a dozen or so of these uh, of these samples uh, by blasting them off the surface okay so that'll be our first mars ascent vehicle so these are the kind of early steps that one does to work up towards the larger systems that doug talked about that's awesome thank you so farouk um, when we hear about crew missions to mars we often hear about major players such as space agencies and private industry um, but we'd like to hear from you, what's the most, what's the importance of engaging more of academia in this kind of endeavor? Very interesting point and question. And I'd like to uh, make this a little more of a historical statement about NASA at the beginning, because I'm the mm -hmm. oldest guy here, so I know that <laughs> that's I can refer to the 60s, <laughs> where I was involved in the space program. And I would like to emphasize the points that Amran has just said about the UAE. And I would like to liken or compare what he said about the UAE initiation of the space agency and NASA in the very beginning. And I see there are five similarities there. The first one is the fact that you need to select the institution that will do the job, make a specific thing about the institution. And when President Eisenhower was there and we had Sputnik to shake up America in 1957, the, the president looked into the situation and said, what's happening? They told him, oh, we have space programs in the Navy, in the, in the Marines, and in, in, uh, in, the, in the Navy, and in the Air Force, and the, and the, the Army. So he said, forget all about that. We we'll them, sh sh shut them off all and create a civilian agency so it will be able to uh, cooperate with all the universities and scientific research institutions. So what agency is it to be, to, be, to be free away from secret stuff and all of that? Number two, specifically say, when would you have to finish that job? Amran said, Sheikh Mohammed told them that I want you to do this before the 50th anniversary of the creation of the OE. So Kennedy in January of 1960 said, I want you to go to the moon and get back to the earth before the end of this decade. These mm -hmm. are the similarities of very specific things. And then <clears throat> the selection of the people to run the show, like Jim Webb, who was uh, uh, the best uh, manager I've ever seen in my whole life, who insisted that we only are going to the moon if you, he would collect all of the big guys at NASA and tell him, if you can do, if you can get all your people and have them do all what they think they are able to do, we're going to fail and we'll never make it to the moon. But if you're going to get each and every person that works for you to do more than what they think they are doing, we'll make it to the moon. Look at that kind of leadership. Third, the fourth item is the, the, the youth. Omran said about the youth in the UAE and what they did. In the, during the Apollo program, the show was run by, by young kids just out of the college. During the Apollo 11 mission, 
myself and several of the astronauts went through the mission control center for asking kids what's what's your name by taking the number number of people asking their name what's your name what's your age what's your age what's your age to take an average the average age of the people that ran the apollo 11 mission was 26 years old that's youth and why depend on youth because they they still have the knowledge from the college they still have the the energy they want to do well they want to prove themselves so they can sit there at their computer or their station for eight hours not to move well somebody wow. without without going anywhere and he will somebody he will see someone moving out like that he will tell him get me a sandwich in your way and that's all he says not what kind of sandwich or what yeah get me a sandwich that's it because he's young <laughs> Stupid many ways and good <laughs> to do this job beautifully and will be sitting there for eight hours and do the job here. He wants to prove himself. And the last point is that they recognize the, the people that produce all kinds of things. And I was when I was at the time of Apollo eleven, I was twenty nine years old. And when I when they saw that I really knew the surface features and did the ta ta ta, I was promoted to secretary of the Lunar Landing Site Selection Committee. So all of the things that Omran has said about the 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 the, uh, the success of the of the space mission was certainly due to these five points that we should keep in mind and 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 compare any agency that does well to these kinds of things because that was the reason for the Apollo success and that was the reason for the success of the AML project of, of the UAE. Now, do you want to talk about the Earth and Mars, or is that enough? Uh, that's good for now, but the question that I have for you when talking about Earth and Mars, so space exploration is a human endeavor, and, and all of you have talked about this. This mission to Mars um, will be a mission on behalf of all of humanity. No matter who goes and no matter what happens, all of us back here on Earth are going to feel like it's for all of us. So um, we hear about roles that human, everyday human beings can play in Earth science, and we all talk about, we know what we can do in Earth science, but what role can they play in helping humanity get to Mars? What can people do, your everyday taxpayer, what can they do um, towards the Mars mission? Do, do anyone? Oh, I'll I, throw I, it I out say, oh, go ahead, go ahead, sorry. No, I said I'll throw it out for all of you, anybody that wants to respond. Well, from my perspective, uh, what's critical is um, they need to know what we're doing. They need to be engaged. Uh, you know, there's, there's nothing like a dialogue um, um, uh, with ideas and, uh, uh, you know, a particip participating in, in the grand inv ad adventure. Uh, the concept of um, uh, exciting our children uh, being able to uh, uh, have them become aware of what's happening, have them think about what they want to do with their careers, have the role models that we need in the agency, uh, diversity of people and ideas always is the winning approach. And that we want to be able to make sure everyone is aware of, and uh, can contribute. Let's see, it looks like we have a cu another question that came in, but Fabian, did you have something you wanted to add to that? I have another question for you too. I wanted to add that uh, we need to get people engaged and also we need to be able to explain that this is complex and difficult. You know, we have been used to think uh, uh, that things are simple, easy, and if we want to do it, uh, it's also because it's difficult and people should not be told that we are going that to do that, to go to Mars, to send humans to Mars and bring them back yeah. in two years. It's not realistic and it's not fair for the people to, that, to say that, you know. They, we have to, uh, we know that uh, people are more intelligent than we uh, used to think. And we should uh, be allowed to explain that uh, we go, um, we will go there, but by step, step by step, as I, as we said before. Yeah, and Fabian, yeah. also with the emergence over the past several decades of many space-based telescopes, and with more still to come, what's the value that the ground-based telescopes bring to space exploration and on Mars and and everywhere? Well, um, planetologists in my institute, you know. They still use ground-based telescopes, but when, well, 
a space mission, it's much better. Yeah, of course. Because you are orbiting the planet, you are roving on the planet. Um, of course, it's, it's much better if you are there. On the other way, um, the instruments that we are able to bring uh, on, on the planet, they are small, they, are, uh, they have limited resources, uh, and they are not always, uh, you know, uh, yes, they are up to date, they are modern uh, instruments, innovative instruments, but they have to survive the travel. Uh, so it's not always uh, the, the, the best instrument you, you can imagine. So, um, yeah, um, you need both, but for exploring the solar system, you know, space missions, that's a must. <laughs> Okay. You know, from a ground-based telescope perspective, uh, you know, NASA uses them all the time. You know, uh, uh, you know, DSN, the Deep Space Network, is a series of ground-based radio telescopes, of course. But in addition to that, our optical telescopes are extremely important. And what we do is uh, indeed scan the sky. We look for near-Earth objects. Uh, we catalog them, uh, we uh, uh, track them, uh, we determine what their overall trajectories will be into the future as far as we can. And um, uh, it, 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 as we go to Mars and live to learn to live and work on that planet, we're going to want to in, in, in really interrogate and understand the environment around Mars. And that, of course, includes um, any near Mars object that uh, may be impacting, uh, impacting the planet. So ground-based telescopes are here to stay. They're an essential part of what we do. Uh, and in, in fact, I, I would dearly love to have a beautiful, large ground-based telescope sitting on the surface of Mars, and I could run it whether I'm here or on the surface of Mars myself, you know, because of the way um, that telescope will be able to look from a different vantage point uh, and, and open up a different set of frequencies. So many advantages. And, you know, the sky is the limit. Let's think of those. <laughs> and the sky is actually not the limit, right? <laughs> That's right. <laughs> there, there are many questions that are pouring in for you all now. So there's one that says there's actually research proving that humans can live there. Are there resources, water, food, et cetera? Farouk, I know you wanted to mention something about that. So do you want to comment? Well, you can consider it as if you're going to Mars, you're going to one of the driest deserts on the Earth. So there is, you can look for water hidden underground. And on Mars, it might be little pieces of ice. But mm -hmm. on, the, in the, in the, in, in, on Earth, it would be underground water. So that you can think about being in the middle of the deserts of nowhere and trying to figure out how do you live in that kind of a very dry, very hot, very... Uh, weird environment where there are no nothing moving and there is no, not a single pl uh, plane of grass. So, uh, if I may, um, one of the really fantastic discoveries that have occurred in the last several years, using our orbiting satellites at Mars and the and the ground penetrating radars, is that we have found a buried glacier. Okay, we have found the old North Pole of Mars. It actually sits at about mid latitude. It's an enormous amount of ice. I mean, it's a, it's probably um, uh, on the size of Germany in terms of the of, of, of uh, you know its uh, size, and in some places, 750 meters thick. So as we look for places to go to Mars. Around the edges are those candidate spots, you know, that, that we would want to land. The overburden in some of the places on this old North Pole is maybe uh, a handful of meters, four or five meters. And, and once, we, once we get access to that ice, then that water resource will be a critical one. And as I mentioned earlier, even though we may need to ensure that we bring fertilizer uh, uh, and other uh, nutrients that would be extracted from the soils, the soils on Mars have the macronutrients and the micronutrients to be able to grow, uh, to grow plants. Now, you won't do that outside right away because they'll never make it, but you'll have uh, new ideas in how to grow them in, in, in pseudo greenhouses that then uh, have a supply of water. Uh, 
and uh, um, the right kind of light that needs to be filtered in and allowing these plants to grow. And so these are some of the new ideas that uh, are being researched right now. That's awesome. There's another question for you all. For the first trip to Mars, how many humans ideally would be sent and what would be the preferred credentials or knowledge base for a successful mission? You need to send several desert geologists. <laughs> <laughs> well, I certainly like the idea that we've got scientists in the mix. Absolutely. As Fabian mentioned, that we, we really, we've really got to have that. But, you know, we've got to have people that, that, that really are, are quite uh, knowledgeable in many different uh, topics. Um, uh, that that are um, ha have good engineering skills, um, you know, um, uh, the ability to repair equipment and the infrastructure, you know, we, and we have to bring with them the right kind of tools, you know, the new technologies that are exploding in the area of three D printing is a critical capability for us. The ability to to, to then uh, if a part wears out in, in, in a piece of equipment, uh, be able to download from Earth the plans necessary to reproduce that part and then bring in the regolith, you know, bring in the dust and, and, and the minerals and the, and, and the resources on Mars to be able to print that part and put it in and get the system back up and running. Even if that part wears out in another week, you can always make another one. So. Yeah. Those new concepts and the new technologies that are coming are really uh, very helpful and, and need to be folded in. So in terms of the number, um, there's probably some studies on that. You know, there's probably, uh, you know, uh, four, maybe six, and uh, for different reasons. Um, and, but I don't think NASA's ever decided on what it, how many it would be yet. Right. A lot of work to do in that area, too. A lot. And another question, has the ratio of prepared food, water, and shelter to what is produced to space missions changed much? Given longer trips, how much more of the food and other essentials will be produced during the trip? And how do you identify those promising technologies to do so? Well, of course, what's happening on Space Station right now is they're growing food. Okay, yeah. They're using what are, the technique of hydroponics. Mm -hmm. And... Um, uh, uh, when you, what I dearly love is when the astronauts come back and want to talk to them about 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 that uh, whole activity, and uh, it's done in a particular area of space station, and all the astronauts seem to love to go in this room, okay, because they can smell the they can smell the plants, mm -hmm. and, and and so it's an invigorating feel. So you have the psychological effect. Uh, the the you know the 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 feeling of of uh, the indeed uh, what you're growing is important and then and then they eat it you know they <laughs> it's really it's really just the start of how how they would live uh, in uh, on the way to the planet and what they would do and to get ready to be able to then be able to land on the surface and be as self sufficient as possible. Awesome. And one other question we have here, the priorities of space agencies often depend on who's heading a government at the time. How can the space community, and that's the entire space community, maintain continuity in its priorities? And how can it ensure that a crewed mission to Mars will remain a priority during changes in administrations? Well, one thing I'll say is just that uh, I think we have done a very good job as a community of um, identifying a very logical stepwise process to going to Mars that really, as I said, involves, you know, the assets we have currently in the International Space Station, building up to sustainable space in the moon and using that environment as a testing environment and then building on to go to Mars. And as Jim points out, in the meantime, we have our robotic uh, uh, precursors out in front of us doing the scouting, doing the prospecting. I think it's a very logical, stepwise um, program that um, really is is apolitical in its approach. In that it is it is just logical steps necessary to proceed for the eventual mission, a long term mission to Mars. And I think to keep our focus on on that objective approach of here are simply here are the challenges that need to be addressed. Here is the order in which we're addressing them, 
and it, it the, the the mission profile kind of lays out logically behind that and i think that is um absolutely that is you know, get another important element of that uh, and that would be the international cooperation uh, yes. i see when i look at uh, the set of missions i've been involved in um, we are stronger together you know we we have um, uh, support from uh, our international partners and in keeping uh, the missions going, making new measurements, doing new things. And that's really invigorating. And it's important for us uh, also uh, uh, to uh, ensure that our missions and the mission data, this is why I think the, the mission data for HOPE is so spectacular because it's gonna be open and available for everyone to look at. And new ideas will be coming and uh, coming out of that for sure. You can just bet on it. That's that's just a real critical part of the program. Fabian, you want to add to what Jim said? Go ahead. I just want to add to what Jim said really quickly that the, um, uh, in addition to the international component, which I think is vitally important that we're all uh, as a community engaged in a, uh, in a coordinated effort, we, we have to also remember academia and the private sector, a lot of um, entrepreneurial efforts going into this as well. And have that entire community um, in, in one consolidated purpose, I think is really key. Good point. Yeah, we have to, to insist on the international cooperation. Uh, we have the example of the International Space Station, but uh, I think that uh, cooperation is the key for uh, sustainability. Um, the importance of the private sector and the industry engagement, as I said, uh, uh, these are really very important missions for industry, and uh, the, that support is, uh, is essential. Absolutely. Amra? Uh, yes, just uh, I think one thing that's very critical if, uh, for ensuring the sustainability of space programs uh, that we as a space community maybe we need to focus on or at least uh, shift the discussion of the public or the, 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 the focus of the discussion with the public. Uh, instead of focusing, I think, uh, on, on trying to justify the rationale behind space program, we should try to engage with the public and get them more involved in finding ways of how to get the most out of those projects for the public. Uh, not everyone will agree, and not everyone's gonna, for example, accept uh, that they say, uh, we're just gonna send something there and then we're gonna get something out of it, maybe or maybe not. So it's more about maybe working with the public and, 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 and getting them engaged and shifting the discussion from rationale and justifying to actually what, how can we get the most out of this? Uh, and having them part of that discussion. And this way, maybe that would help um, I mean, I guess each government and each country has their own system and their own uh, political system in place that, that maybe um, gives a direction for the space program. And sometimes these shifts happen, you know, every couple of years, it depends. Uh, but in general, for the sustainability, I think that's the best way, regardless of what political system is in place uh, within any nation. Okay. Thank you. And I have one more question. This last question is, it is said that necessity and opportunity drive technology and innovation. This opportunity to go to Mars will surely drive technological advancements now, but what kind of technology and innovation opportunities do you think will emerge once we learn more from the Martian surface itself? Doug, do you want to take a crack at that one? Well, I think, yeah, I, think I couldn't say that, that, that statement any better. The fact is that as we choose to, to, to do these things that are incredibly difficult, incredibly hard, really forces us to measure the best of us, of our international community, our innovators around the world. And um, we'll find that there are many, many, in many challenges that we encounter in this effort. We've talked a lot about the Institute resource and developing resources in an austere environment. Those resources, whether that includes producing power, producing oxygen, clean water, um, growing foods, all of those are technologies that we will necessarily address um, and we will find solutions that we don't anticipate. And they may come from areas where we, again, having the broadest community of innovators involved in this, where we get ideas from places we may not even expect from outside the community, maybe uh, if as much as we can have citizens and other industries participating. But we'll, we'll find that every one of those, get, those breakthroughs that we make will have immediate impact. As if, and, and this is certainly one of the biggest problems um, that many people throughout the developing world are encountering is access to clean water and 
and, and energy, um, you know, clean air and, and, and developed world for that matter. And I think these will have immediate impact on our quality of life right here on Earth. So I think there, there's just a, it's, it's impossible to predict all the potential breakthroughs. But one thing we have learned, um, again, history being our guide from the Apollo and, and all the space missions over the last several decades, is some of the things we did right? developing CMOS sensors for miniaturized sensors have now found their way into every, you know, every uh, cell phone camera on the world, revolutionized photography. Um, that a lot of the technologies that we have necessarily developed because not only are the machines in an austere environment, but humans are in an austere environment. So we've developed a whole host of um, remote medicine, miniaturized medicine, um, sensors and systems that have found their way in applications and sensors and uh, in medicine and remote environments on Earth. And I think we'll see a, just again a proliferation of ideas um, that are that we find are necessary for space, but have even more impact here on Earth. So, Absolutely. If I may, um, so Doug talked about it from a technology perspective. I'd like to talk about it from a science perspective. All right. As I mentioned, one of the things that I'm excited about is the opportunity to go to Mars and look for signs of life. Uh, perhaps past life, uh, perhaps even uh, current life. Now, we don't believe uh, that uh, we'll find complex life on Mars, but if we do find life, and it's a, a microbial life, it will be an enormous discovery. It will actually change our world view that we are not alone and unique in the galaxy. In addition to that, discovery of microbial life, whether it's like us or not like us, will have profound effects on a whole variety of topics in medicine and genetics. Uh, it will be as important as the discovery of the double helix in DNA. I mean, it, so those are the possible discoveries that may be awaiting us by going to Mars. And as I mentioned, the solar system is available for us as, as humans on this planet. We are the first species that have the ability to leave this planet, go out in the solar system, return, also stay. Let's take that advantage. Let's move out in the solar system and learn what we can and learn our place, not only in the solar system, but in the galaxy. The solar system is ours. Let's explore it together. On that note, I want to say thank you to all of you for taking the time to be with us here today and to, to share your thoughts with the global community. We really, really appreciate it. And I want to thank you very much for, for your participation. Have a great rest of the day. Thank you so much. <laughs> thank you, everyone. Bye now. Bye.